So now I will show you some of the details from one of the table mappings. I must admit I ended the last recording part because like, a garbage truck was just coming by and I thought I'd get loud. So, But I, I do think, as I said before, that lots of little ones are better than a few big ones. So I'm going to show you the details here. I'm trying to keep this readable but sort of small. So in fact, I'm going to sc screw around with these windows just so that this section is nice and big. So these are the details for a particular table that I've mapped from the source to the target. Um, and so this first tab here, column mappings, just shows me what columns on the source are mapped to what columns on the target. And in this case, the source and the target have the same set of columns so that when I did the, the, the wizard path that I did before and CDC made its guess as to what a good mapping would be, in fact, you know, it picked, given the structures were the same, it, it suggested that it, I'd want this mapping like this. You know, it's a good first, good, bad, and certainly if your source and target tables have the same structure, then this wizard path is going, going to get the mapping right. Um, but if it didn't get it right, you can just fix it up. You can say, no, actually, I want to map. I could, I wanted to map this. It told me, wait, no, the, the, the data types aren't compatible, so that won't work. That's fine. Um, I could put in a journal control field. This is meta information about um, the change on the source. So, for example, I and, and maybe the one that people care about the most is the user. So I could, in fact, say that in fact, what I want to have in the target database is the user. What what was the database user that made the change on the source? Um, but I could say no. Maybe I just want to go back to the name. I can also do what we call we call expressions. So um, I can create some an expression. We've got an expression editor that would let me do the sort of all the normal sort of things. Um, it's a pretty basic set, you know, the simple things of two char, replace, right trim, left trim. Um, get call lets me actually call out to the source database. So if I wanted to do a lookup on the source database, I could do that here. Um, so lots of lots of things here. It's pretty lightweight transformations. It's, you know, it's really, f you know, this isn't a replacement for a, 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 an ETL tool, but it lets you do Sort of minor adjustments with the data from the between the source and the target. Filtering again, as I mentioned in the first video, we're really focused on making sure that all the impact we have on the system is getting business value. So you can um, filter, you do any sort of row level filtering um, on the source side. So, for example, you might decide that you actually only want to replicate things that it, that you know, occurred on the West Coast because you've got a, a maybe a, you've got data for your entire region, but it's only the West Coast data that you want to replicate to this other database. So you could put a filter there. It's it, it's the same sort of expression language that, that you can use for this. Um, as well on the, um, you can also just pick what columns you're sending that may be part of the source table you don't think is relevant to the target. And we also have this notion of critical columns, which uh, I think is sort of interesting. It came directly from a customer request. A critical, a column that isn't critical is a column where you're happy to have the data on the target, but you're not, don't think it's worth the impact on your network, on the systems to replicate a change that only changed these non-critical columns. If I was doing this demo f 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I might have said, you know, a good example of a non-critical column might be an email address because yes, you might have email addresses for some of your clients, but you, that's not your primary means of communication. You might need to well keep it up to date, but it's sort of, it's interesting. Now, my example would be a fax number. Yeah, if you've got a fax number for a client, sure, you might as well have it in this other system, but you're probably not going to send faxes, so you might decide it's just not that important. Um, again, that's something you can do if you decide you want to really, you know, put in, if figure out exactly what you care about on the target side. Translation is really, again, a lightweight um, value translation. You could go from, say, you know, state codes to state names on the target side. Oh, again, lightweight stuff, but um, it's there if you need it. Encoding, if the source and target databases 
accurately know the encoding of their character data, then there's nothing you need to do. CDC automatically figures out or understands how to do the encoding, the transformation from the source to the target. In some cases, especially for older applications that were maybe implemented and had to handle international data before the database could handle international data, you will have essentially lied to the database. You will have used some sort of column in, this, in the, the database that wasn't maybe was designed to hold ASCII or was just designed to hold you know, binary data and you actually put in character data and you know the encoding of that. In that case, what you do, what you can do on the screen is you can tell us what the encoding of that data really is, even, you know, differing from what the database thinks. And once you've done that, told us that, then again, we'll do all the appropriate translations to between the source and the target to, to replicate the data correctly. Example here, so I could edit this and I could say that, you know, it's some entirely different encoding. Or I could actually say, you know, this is actually binary data. It's not really, the database thinks it's UTF-8, but I actually know I've got JPEG images or some sort of general binary data here. Um, conflicts. So if you're doing bidirectional replication that I talked about in the first video where changes might be occurring on both the first, both the source and the target at the same time, conflicts can occur. A conflict is really when a change is made on both databases at the same time, in the sense that I make a change on database A and someone else makes a change to that same row on database B before the change that it made on A made it to B. And that's important to detect because you want to make sure that you get the data consistent and at, at the end of it. And so the, the first thing is to detect the conflict. We detect conflicts by checking whether or not the target looks the same as the source did when we go to apply the change. So in the case I, I gave where I made a change on A and then someone else made a change on B, when I go to apply the change on A, the row on B won't look the same. Some of the column values will have changed, so that's how we'll be able to tell that a conflict occurred. And so in this tab, you can pick what columns to use to detect conflicts. And again, it's, it can be somewhat similar to the critical column thing where you might decide there are columns that just aren't important. But by default, we're going to detect, detect do conflict detection on all the columns we can. And then if we detect a con uh, conflict, you can determine how to resolve it. Let me figure out how to turn this on. And so you can have, um, you can just sort of ha decide that between A and B, A is the master so that when you're replicating from A to B, the source would win, and re replicating from B to A, the target would win. Um, so very sort of basic built-in options, or you can call a user exit. Again, I won't go into all the details. Bidirectional replication is an interesting, um, tough problem to solve, and uh, replication is really useful. And it's necessary for bidirectional sort of active-active deployments, but it doesn't make it trivial, so that could be a whole other video. Operation, at some point, if what you want to do is beyond the scope of what we've made sort of easy and sort of out of the box, you can s you this gives you fine-grained control over what's happening. So you might decide, in fact, I just don't want to replicate deletes or I don't want to replicate updates. Um, there's no simple, single reason to do this. If it was sort of a standard pattern of usage that had people going to this tab, we'd add a new mapping to support it. But this is... You're for situations that are just a little bit unexpected, I guess. And then user exits, sort of one step beyond that, you can just write a user exit. It can be in Java, it can be in a stored procedure language of your target database. And that user exit gets access to the data, get ac gets access to our connection to the database. You can do whatever you want to um, as far as how you want to handle this, this operation. You can decide to do something entirely different about how you put the data in the database, you could use it to integrate with some entirely different system as well. Um, and you indicate what events this should be called in. So you might decide that, in fact, I want to call it both before the insert occurred and after the insert occurred. Be before insert might change some values, after insert might inspect results and stuff. So 
um, this gives you sort of complete control. So that's the details for table level mapping. That seems like a big chunk of time, so I'll declare this to be another video on its own. Thanks.